This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. Today we have a service call on a walk-in freezer that is not maintaining the correct temperature. They say it's maintaining 9 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit and we're looking for about negative 10. So I quickly went into the evaporator and I'll show that in a second. It's not frozen up, the temperature controller is calling. It does feel a little bit warm in there. I dropped a thermometer and went up onto the roof just to do a visual. Came up onto the roof, everything's running. Um, we've got some ice on the suction line, which isn't a big deal. But the biggest thing is that the sight glass is flashing. That's what I noticed right away is the sight glass is flashing. And this is a silly walk-in unit. Colpac makes this one. If you look at that receiver, there's no king valve on the receiver. <clears throat> so there's no way to pump the system down and change that liquid line filter dryer. I hate this one. The only service valve you have is this liquid line service valve right here. So silly. So silly. I do not like that. I guess you could probably still call that a king valve, but I just... This is the dumbest thing, so you can't change the dryer without recovering the charge out of this unit. One of the silliest things. But anyways, um, we've got to get some service gauges on this guy, verify that it's actually low on charge, and then uh, we'll troubleshoot from there. So we have about positive seven degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature inside the walk-in freezer. And if we come up to the evaporator and look behind, there's no weird frost patterns or anything, but the expansion valve is making a funny noise. And that's because it's feeding vapor refrigerant to the expansion valve. That's a problem. The thermostat is set below zero. That doesn't mean that it's working correctly. We have to check calibration to make sure it's actually calibrated. What you can do is just simply turn it warmer. It turns off at positive six and it turns on at zero. And we were set at about negative six. So I've confirmed that the thermostat is working even though I don't like that style of thermostat. It's a piece of junk, but. So what we need to do, I'm just doing a visual inspection. I don't see any refrigerant leaks. Definitely don't like the way the sensing bulb is ran. So we're gonna need to put some gauges on this guy and figure out if it's low on charge or not. All right, so we are still flashing. Um, box temp's about five degrees now. Almost no subcooling. Yeah, so we're gonna go ahead and add some charge to this guy. When I'm charging with my probes, I just have my hose that has a low loss fitting on one side and a ball valve on the other purge everything out. <clears throat> I weighed my cylinder before I brought it on the roof so I can find out how much gas I used. And we're just going to go ahead and proceed to clear the sight glass. A little bit out of time. And I'm just kind of working the ball valve. I've got a suction port, uh, suction probe all the way down at the evaporators measuring the true evaporator superheat. Obviously we're flooding back to the compressor too because we've got really low superheat. So I do want to be careful. We may need to uh, adjust on that superheat. I don't know. No, we're going to clear up. The, it doesn't look like it's going to take much to clear up the glass. We might just have to adjust the TXV. Okay, so we cleared up the sight glass. Honestly, it didn't even take a pound. So I don't know that it was actually low on charge. It may just be the expansion valve acting wonky. So we're gonna go down and adjust the superheat because we're still running an extremely low superheat. Uh, it's saying negative, which is impossible, but basically it's, uh, actually no. Uh, yeah, it's still saying negative right here, which you know is impossible, but um, we're gonna go down and adjust on that superheat. So we're just flooding back to the compressor. And you can tell it's been happening for a while because all the dirt right here is, you know, you can tell it's just been getting, it's bloody for a while. So we're gonna go adjust that superheat. All right, so I pulled the superheat cap off or the adjustment cap off and we're gonna drive the, um, what do you wanna call it? The screw or whatever into the valve to bring the superheat up. So we're gonna go about half a turn and that's about it. You don't wanna go too much. 
We're looking for about six degrees evaporator superheat on this bad boy. Not a fan of these Emerson valves because the power heads aren't replaceable on this style. Kind of silly. So, got to give it time after you make a superheat adjustment. We're going to watch. We're going to step outside the box and watch the readings. Here's my superheat right here, and it really hasn't improved, so we're going to give it another half a turn to a... We'll probably give it one full turn and see what that does. You still got to just be very careful with these valves, but I have a feeling we're going to have a bad valve here, but we'll see what we can get here. Okay, so... The adjustment screw you're going to go into the valve to the top of the power head to raise the superheat and down out of the valve to bring the superheat down but we need to raise it okay so that's one full turn four quarter turns and we're going to see what that does for us so i am not getting a response from that expansion valve no matter what i do i turned on it like three full turns in and i'm still sitting at 1.9 degrees superheat I'm going to go ahead and take, jump out on a limb and say that that expansion valve is faulty, it's bad. Um, but before I change the valve, I'm going to do a couple tests on the compressor to make sure that uh, the compressor is not bad. My worry running such low superheat is that we have uh, pushed all the oil out of the compressor. And that's an almost impossible thing to fix um, on a system like this. The evaporator is about 25 feet below me right now, condenser's up on the roof. If we washed all the oil out of this thing, it's going to suck. Um, but we're just going to do some tests, check the Copeland mobile app, see how it says the compressor is performing, do some amp tests, and then go from there. Everything checks out on the Copeland mobile app. We're looking good as far as the compressor performance goes. So um, we're going to go ahead and look into changing this expansion valve. i got to see if I actually have the valve with me. I'm pretty sure I do. Um, but then we'll have to recover the charge and go through all that stuff. So. I did a little quick test and pumped it down to see if I could pull it into a vacuum and it would hold pressure in a vacuum. Uh, and it pretty much did. I mean, it pulled down to negative one. I'm a little concerned. I'd like to see it pull lower than that, but it's not rising like the suction reads bad or anything like that. So um, we're going to go ahead and try to just change this valve and hopefully the compressor is doing okay after that. Okay, so I went in here and I wanted to see sometimes these valves can be a little sticky. And I still want to change the expansion valve, but I actually got it to adjust. What I did was I ran the adjustment stem all the way in, then all the way out, then to the middle position, and then I adjusted from there. So I, I basically cleared whatever was sticking inside that valve that was causing a problem. Notice my box temp is dropping now, and uh, my superheat is running about nine degrees. I'm not gonna adjust on it too much more. We're just gonna let it run. I, I do still want to change this valve, but this way I can insert a proper quote and do it properly. It's holding pretty good for now. Superheat's down to eight degrees. <clears throat> We're down to negative two in the box. So it's looking pretty good. Um, looking good in here. We're gonna set that temp control. So what I'm gonna do, because big picture, um, we have a lot of problems with these uh, these coils, with the solenoid valves and everything. So I'm gonna quote to change uh, thermostat, put in a digital expansion valve, solenoid valve, and then we'll recover the charge, put in a new liquid line uh, side glass and dryer up on the roof. We'll go with flare dryers, and then we'll get rid of this mess and clean up the wiring in here. Um, that'll be my solution to this, uh, so long as I see it come down to temperature. So I'm gonna watch this thing and adjust on this uh, temp control, make sure it's set correctly, and go from there. You know, I wanted to point something out too. <clears throat> Again, I'm biased. I don't like these Emerson Alco valves, whatever. Um, they're just, I don't know, I have problems with them. Maybe it's just because I don't understand them, I don't know. I'm just not a fan and they, they I see problems with them. I'm not saying that the issue we're having here is completely that valve, but um, I don't like the fact that you can't change the power heads on those. Not that I think I have a bad power head. I think that there was some moisture or something like that stuck inside the valve, frozen. Um, some wax buildup or something, some kind of contaminant. If this was a Sporlin valve, I'd probably just take it apart, inspect it, and put it back together. Or even replace the internal components. But I just don't like these Emerson valves. Um, and, you know, this is one of those things where I've done a lot of work on these cold pack coils. And I, I run into these issues. So, you know, I'm getting ahead of the game and going to quote the solenoid valve, the temperature controller, and the expansion valve. 
just my personal preference. I'm not saying that's the right way to do it every single time. Um, but I will say that usually you shouldn't have to adjust on expansion valves. If you have to adjust on expansion valves, there's either contaminants in it or the valve is starting to go bad. Um, after after first initial startup, that's my personal preference. Going, you know, having to go in there and work on it after the fact indicates that there's some kind of contaminants or something in there. Looks like we just turned back on or turned off too. I'm gonna have to check that. Something just satisfied it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it warmer. It turned off, so we just turned on. So we need to go a little bit colder. Not right there. So it actually satisfied. See. They haven't had this thing satisfy in a very long time. So we were flooding the coil right now, before. And once I reduced the refrigerant through it, the flooding slowed it down, got my super heat dialed in. We actually came down and satisfied. So I'm gonna go ahead and start taking my stuff off of this. Um, I'm confident it's gonna work and then we're just gonna quote to change all those parts. Look at that, we've got a happy compressor. Cool, old suction line coming back to it, but it's not flooding back anymore. Not that, ice on the head of the compressor is bad. That just means that the temperature of the suction line and the temperature of the refrigerant is below dew point and freeze point. But um, this one was excessive and you could tell it had been going on for a very long time. So yeah, we're looking good um, for now temporarily. Sight glass is still clear. So um, unfortunately, I'm not gonna change the receiver because you know it's still working. What we'll do is we'll just make sure the liquid line dryers after this valve right here we'll cut out this stupid quick connect liquid line dryer and sight glass right here and then this will be a come our king valve pumping the system down before i left i wanted to inspect that compressor contactor <clears throat> you can definitely see just the cover there's some arcing going on and it's going to be hard to see but it's really bad shape you can see some pitting really bad so we're going to quote to change that guy out too that's not good so Again, big picture diagnosis, guys. Big picture diagnosis. So to recap, we had a service call on a walk-in freezer that just wasn't getting cold enough. The complaint was that it was maintaining, I think, like six to nine degrees positive temperature. Uh, that's Fahrenheit. And um, they want to be in the negatives, basically. Um, closer to negative 10. Uh, if we're keeping ice creams in here that they're going to scoop, we typically want to maintain our walk-in freezers at about negative 10 degrees. So uh, when I arrived, I found that the unit had uh, a flashing sight glass, and I noticed that there was quite a bit of frost uh, coming back to the compressor, uh, indicating that it was flooding. Now, like I mentioned in the video, just because there's frost doesn't necessarily mean there's something bad. You have to evaluate the situation and take the readings and figure out what was going on. In our case, we were flooding back to the compressor. We had uh, on the, the evaporator superheat measurement, we actually had zero degrees superheat. Even though it said negative, that's impossible. So it was zero degrees superheat. Now, I never measured it at the compressor. I imagine it was probably a couple degrees superheat at the compressor because it is going to gain some heat on the way back up to the compressor. You're not necessarily going to have zero degrees at the compressor too. But it was definitely low enough to be a concern. Now, the extremely low superheat on the compressor can cause all kinds of problems, okay? Um, it can cause... Uh, it can basically cause the compressor to have oil problems. It can uh, push the oil out of the compressor, basically, you know, and it can wreak havoc on the system. Um, obviously, you saw that the performance of my evaporator wasn't working very well either, but there was also something funky going on with that expansion valve. So at first, I got a couple adjustments out of it, and I noticed there was no change in anything. And uh, that made me concerned, makes me want to change that valve. Uh, and I was getting ready to change it, but then, you know, I'd rather with this particular customer, I'm allowed to go ahead and do emergency fixes, but it's a little bit more of a pain because they have not to exceed values and different things. And don't get me wrong. I would have gotten paid, but I just prefer to go through the quoting process. So that way they know what they're getting up ahead. And then I can also make sure that I have the right components to install them. I'm sure I could have gotten it going, but anyways, um, what I did was I made those adjustments. I adjusted the valve one full turn and I got no change out of it, which is concerning. Okay. So then, uh, you know, just before, uh, or it's kind of like a last ditch effort. What I did was I was worried about something being sticky inside the valve. And so I ran the, the adjustment stem all the way in, all the way out back to the center point, 
and then I adjusted the superheat from there and it started to respond. So what that did is it confirmed that there was something sticking inside the valve. Uh, the needle that opens and closes on the valve probably had some goo or something like that on it. There could have been ice formation inside of it because of moisture contamination. There's a lot of things that it could have been, okay? So we got the valve to start responding. This is a temporary fix until I can go ahead and do the proper quote. And we're gonna go ahead and quote to clean up the system. Now, out of uh, precaution, my quote is going to include a new refrigerant, a proper evacuation, liquid line filter dryer, a new sight glass that's a little bit easier to see because that uh, Danfoss valve that's in there is a little bit difficult to work with. Or, I'm sorry, Danfoss sight glass. Um, and we're going to put in a proper uh, expansion valve. I prefer the Sporlin valves because uh, I'm just very comfortable with them and they have replaceable components. You can change the power heads, which more than likely or most of the time I should say is the part that fails because the, the sensing element rubs out on things. Um, but yeah, I just prefer the Sporlin valves myself. Uh, so that's what we're going to quote to do. And then I'm also going to change that temperature controller just because I don't like the, I, I'm just not a fan of that style of control. Um, I prefer to have a digital and or a, a Johnson pen, like an A19 mechanical control if I had to. So We'll see. Um, I'm going to submit the quotes. I know that they're going to approve it, but like I said, I just wanted to go through the proper procedures and make sure everything was working properly. Um, it's also interesting, you know, you guys can see the temperature change in the box too once my uh, expansion valve started to react. Um, also, if you remember in the beginning of the video, I mentioned that the expansion valve was making a funky noise too. <clears throat> More than likely, um, you know, it was just because we were feeding vapor refrigerant and or um, we had uh, just something funky going on in the valve that wasn't allowing it to work properly. Uh, I only added, it was actually like eight ounces, nine ounces of refrigerant to the system and it cleared up the sight glass. So I actually don't think that it was low on charge. I think that something was going on with that expansion valve that was making the system act like it was low on charge and making the sight glass flash. So Anyways, <clears throat> I want to say thank you guys so very much for taking the time to watch these videos. I really appreciate it. Be sure to send me an email if you have questions to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. Leave a comment on this YouTube video. Uh, pay attention. I do my live streams Monday night. Or Monday nights usually typically at 5 p.m. Pacific Coast time. Uh, and I'll go and answer most of the questions that you guys send me on these YouTube videos and different things. And so stay tuned. Keep an eye on that. And uh, other than that, we will catch you guys on the next one. Okay.